Hi and welcome to Outlaw Bookseller with me, Steve Neandrews, writer, bookseller, collector. And I thought it was time for a channel update, also a bit of an unboxing, and to really talk about some booktube things. You know, there's a lot of videos on YouTube about the booktube community and the sort of topics around reading. And I'm going to do some more of those myself and give you the sort of point of view from my angle, which of course is a professional one, as somebody who's worked in the book trade for a long time, professionally bonks things on his desk, you'll pardon the expression. So I think we'll begin just by talking about the channel. It's very warm this morning, it's mid-March and it's very grey outside, it's my day off. I'm on a holiday for the next, um, most of the next week. I've got to work for one day before the paperback fair, which is on Sunday the 24th, which I've talked about numerous times on the channel. I am hoping to meet some of you there. And of course that's in London at the Holiday Inn, Bloomsbury, and I'll put the details below. I'm kind of looking forward to it, but I have to be honest, I'm very much in a hardcover mode and I'll come back to that later in the video. So theoretically, you know, I could go along and spend a lot of money on paperbacks. I don't think I'm going to. I'm going to rock up slightly late because the first train from where I live in Bath doesn't get me into London till 10.30, which is when the doors open. And then with a bit of luck, I should be on the reading list and breeze in. And um, you'd be able to recognise me because I'll be wearing my I'd rather be reading Ballard book, which Dorset Bob gave me. And I'm going to spend some time bringing a tootle around and do some shooting and uh, meeting and talking to other sort of paperback fans. And also I'll be doing some guest book selling with Bob and hopefully with Morris as well if he needs to help. But Jules Burt will be there, of course, as well. So hopefully I'll see you there. So where are we on the channel? Well, we are just around about on 7,000 subscribers. We've gained a thousand since just before Christmas. And that's pretty much in line with my expectations. The channel's been going for two years and seven months now. And I would expect or hope to be at 10,000 subscribers by um, the end of December this year, 2024. The theory is at that point, the visibility of the channel will increase and then we'll see some more exponential growth. But I have to be realistic because the fact is a lot of people watching YouTube, their first expectation is high production values. And we haven't moved that forward much on the channel, I will admit, because I simply don't have the budget. My PC doesn't have enough RAM for green screen. I can't afford and I don't need to upgrade it for any other usage. So it's not justifiable yet. And, you know, I just don't have the budget that some booktubers have. You'll see a lot of the younger ones, particularly, I'm sure a lot of them are still living at home. They're in these sort of airbrushed, perfect environments. They've got a tiny collection of books. This is slightly different, as you'll see. And, you know, they're young, they're good looking and they're fresh and they're, lots of their peers want to watch them. This tends to be a channel which attracts a broader demographic, especially amongst the older age groups. And I've no problem with that at all. You know, it is what it is. So, you know, it, it, it would be nice to get to 10,000 and see things roll a bit further. And then hopefully then I can sort of increase things. But I'm going to start to work on new production techniques and things. Now, I like shooting outside, as you know, and something that's going to happen last year i went to italy and paris capri and paris those videos have been viewed by a small number of people which raises an interesting point about the algorithm that if you do different things then it doesn't essentially work for you if you do one thing that's what people go for but i haven't noticed recently that walkabout videos my out and abouts one of them which i filmed in Corsham and wiltshire which is not too far from here but started to take off a bit more and it's modest compared to similar things and it's a better video than some of them um yet you know they've never had much views so um it's a strange thing really so it does show that the algorithm really does favor you to stick on a particular subject this has always been meant to be an interdisciplinary channel so you know that's the way it's going to continue even though there has been an sf focus because that's what's helped the channel to grow on that front, let's do an unboxing. This is something which um, I found last week. 
and it's very uncommon indeed. So I'm just going to pop it open and show it to you now. And I bought this from a dealer who I once um, went for a job with. And I have to say, I wouldn't have worked for this person even if, you know, I'd been desperate because quite frankly, it, you know, I didn't think a lot of them and they're not a dealer I buy a lot from. I'm not going to say who or where they are or when this interview was. They were 20 minutes late and I thought that was really, really rude. And, you know, it was obviously one of those things where I clearly knew too much. This is a dealer who um, has quite a good international reputation, but I think it's probably most people who don't know this stuff. They tend to be overpriced. Their grading is a bit suspect. And I'll only buy for them if it's a last resort, if they've got something I really want. So I'm going to show you what it is now. Right, so as you see, it's a Garland Yellow Jacket. And this is a book by somebody who I really like. And a video recently on the channel covered some of her work, some of the more famous work. And I have been acquiring more of her books over the last sort of year or two. And I am wondering how far I'm going to go into completism. And I think I'm going to cut it off about 1980 because she got a bit woo woo after that. And I'm really pleased with this. This wasn't cheap. So I've had to sell some stuff on eBay to make the money up. And this is The Wind's 12 Quarters by Ursula Le Guin. Now, I know it's Le Guin. I say Le Guin. I've got to get out of that habit. I know it's probably because I'm Welsh because I am a bit of a stickler for correct things, as you know. But pronunciation, who's to say? But I know she said Le Guin. So I'll try and make it good from going forward. And this is short stories. Let me just have a look. This is a first 1976 and absolutely lovely. Very uncommon book. Um, really pleased to have that. So really, I'm looking to complete, I guess, with Lagan. Lagan. What I really need is to get, let's just get that position nicely so you can actually see it. Can you see it? I think you can or you can't. Yes, you can. And really, I think what I want to do is do the first editions up until about 1980, really. I'm missing a few things. I'm missing the word for world is forest. Now, of course, really, that first appeared in Dangerous Visions, so I should, in a purest sense, go for a first edition of Dangerous Visions, which I'm not going to do because it's really expensive. Um, I'll just watch out until um, I see it, I guess. That's an uncommon one. That's a Gollancks yellow jacket as well. And I'm also missing the third in the World of Exile and Illusion trilogy, the initial three Hainish books. Here's a really nice tour omnibus edition of those three. And I bought this quite some years ago because my paperbacks are really ratty and beat up. And the Panthers now of these are really, really uncommon, but these are really good. They're like a breath of fresh air. And though I've got a feeling I've never read City of Illusions, I can't remember ever having read it. So do watch out for that. Really, really nice. I think you can still get this. I'm not certain. And of course, there's a Golanx Masterworks edition, which came out last year. So it's not as nice as this, though. This is absolutely lovely. And I don't normally like trade paperbacks, but that's a beauty. So the, it's those two really, City of Illusion and Word for Order's Forest, to sort of collecting targets. The Earthsea books, the first three, yeah, I would like them, but they're usually really expensive. They're hard to find. I've got recent sort of editions, which are OK, and they're not yellow jackets. They are sort of pictorial things, which are really nice, but I don't think I'm going to go there. You've got to stop at some point. Now, an interesting thing about The Wind's 12 Quarters is that this is the Panther paperback, which I've had for years and I have read. However, in very small print on the back, underneath the title, it says Volume 1. Now, this is fairly common and has always been fairly common, though she's more and more collectible these days because her way of writing and thinking fits the narrative, as they say, the woke identity politics of today. Uh, nothing wrong with that because she's absolutely brilliant. She's a pioneer of these things. And that's the real point. All this stuff was looked at in SF decades ago. It's not new. Move on from it. Let's tackle something else. But volume two in Panther is really hard to find. And I don't have one. I've never had one. And you know me, I'm a condition guy. So when I've come across them, they've been beat up. But I haven't seen one literally for years and years and years. So a good half of this I haven't read. So it's a chunkier book doesn't look that much chunky because it's a hard cover. So there's some things in there I've not read, which would be great. So what I'll probably do is read the lot because it's been a long time since I read this. But great, great stuff. Probably my favourite short story by her will be no surprise 
to anybody and let's see if it's in this um i first read it in anthology and that's the ones who walk away from omelas which is a really important story yeah and it is in here so there we go yeah it is in there that's a great story really love that and i talked about that on the channel a while ago i think i talked about it i can't remember which video it was i do apologize so it is what it is so a bit of Lagan, but moving back onto broader matters i have been thinking a lot about these videos i've seen discussing various reading topics on booktube and one of the words that comes up a lot is community i think community is an overused word anyway and it's a word which to me smacks of orthodoxy and i and my big problem at the moment politically and you know it's been a big thing for me as long as i can remember has been, been about the danger of orthodoxy and the importance of the individual now of course in a political sense it's often people on the right who will argue for the importance of the individual and usually what the sort of libertarians and anarchists and capitalists often mean is that you know you've got to be free as an individual so you can exploit people and i don't really sort of go down that way i mean individuality in a more sort of broad sense and that what i mean is that you know some people just are natural different naturally different and they're outsiders and i feel that way myself and you know maybe i'm deluded but i always recall when i was in school and i grew up on a mountain in wales and quite lonely i was a bit of a lonely kid typical sort of reader and I went to school and I really struggled, you know, I, I, str I struggled to fit in. And then I met peers in my teens who seemed to have the same interests as me. And what fascinated me about those two people, two of them in particular, was that I put down my assumed outsiderdom, and maybe I was just being a romantic youth, down to the fact that I'd lived in a place where there wasn't much social interaction and that would affect me that way. But these two friends of mine, they seem much the same as me and they'd grown up in streets, you know, in sort of in fairly rough streets in um, in the States and things. So that was a real revelation. So I started to think about is individuality is difference inborn. And that gets you thinking about the whole two cultures debate of, you know, genetics, inheritance, heredity and environment and the two things. And I think in human nature, both things are really important. I don't think it's one or the other. I really think that both are very, very important. I think biology has a definite advantage because you can't escape your genes, you know. And uh, one of the credos of existentialism is that existence precedes essence, that you exist first and you are individual. Uh, but then your essence is up for grabs, but you have to make yourself free to choose. And I think that's the case, except that, you know, you do inherit things, not just physical characteristics. You inherit temperamental characteristics from your parents and grandparents and what have you. There's no doubt about it. That's what I've seen time and time again. So, you know, so community's an overused word. So I guess really, do I feel a great need to interact with a community on booktube? It's a question of time a lot. I interact with people like Matt at Bookpilled, Richard at Vintage SF, John at Sci-Fi Scavenger, Matt Defoe at Science Fiction Reads. Started recently interacting a bit with Ira at SF Words of Wonder. All, you know, all great guys. Jules Burt, obviously, you've seen on the channel and he and I are mates and we were before we started on this journey going back some years. And really, I don't really have a lot of time. I, I'm trying to sort of fit reading in, work, life, dealing with health problems, as I've said. So, you know, I've done a few collabs. I've done them with John, obviously with Jules. Um, I've done author interviews, which is a different thing as far as I'm concerned. I sometimes feel there are not enough people who I can interact with on my level. And I don't mean that in any superior sense, but the fact is there's an awful lot of booktube channels, and I'm speaking specifically about SF, but it does cover other ones as well. Um, they're run by people who are reading in a very scattershot way and like most people and most people do that and you know they don't have any authority that's fine because it's just it's a democratic thing they don't have to have authority they're just expressing their opinions but there is something to be said for what Harlan Ellison came up with which is you are not entitled to your opinion you're entitled to your informed opinion and I'd like to think that you know my opinion is a bit informed having worked in 
the industry for 40 years and written books and what have you. So I do think it carries a bit of weight. So um, I'm not going to bend over backward to be modest, but I do think that is one thing which separates this channel from others. And, you know, there are people who are natural born critics like Matt at Bookpelt, you know, and he worked in a bookshop for a while, I know. So I do think that sometimes I've got a broader perspective on the specifics, if you see what I mean. Part of my job is recommending and suggesting and has been for a long time and using the knowledge. You have to do the reading, but there is a lot of scattershot reading and we all do it because there's so much. And that was part of the deal with me writing my books in the 100 Must Read series, um, science fiction, fantasy and books for men. And there are others out there in that series. And it came around because, you know, there was clearly a need to try and sort of pinpoint things for people more. And one of the things which has come up on BookTube recently, and I've seen Steve Donahue talking about other people's videos. I do watch Steve's stuff because he's a real hardcore bibliophile. And you know, that man is a serious book buyer. And he's very quirky and fun. And um, and I like his breadth of what, what he does. And the question came up as, you know, are we all reading too much? Do people on BookTube particularly read too much? They're cramming it in, they're ticking it off, what have you. And, you know, I can certainly say I felt that pressure myself. And, you know, even though I've read tons and tons of SF, you know, you can say to me, what have you read by Philip K. Dick? Everything. What have you read by Brian Aldiss? At least 25 books. What have you read by Ballard? Everything. And so on and so on. I was going to do a video which was like, asking the question on the screen what have you read by enlisting authors and saying but you know i'd have to go through all the books do a count oh, it'd just be exhausting maybe i'll do it one day but it's a lot put it that way and a lot of it is of quality but i see um younger booktubers and people who haven't had the time to read you know sort of sort of catching up and sort of getting a lot of books under their belt and with a lot of vintage sf particularly you can do that because the books are short and that's great and it reminds me of my reading in the 80s particularly when i would burn through things you know i was very systematic an author at a time mostly or i'd have four authors on the go and i'd read all their work in a year or what have you and there was never a plan it just turned out that way i read what i liked and what i felt was good and it got more scattershot as time goes on so it is an interesting phenomenon. I actually think, am I spending too much time on reading? I don't think I'm spending enough. You know, I do about a book a week these days. It's a lot less than I used to. I used to do about a hundred. And you see some channels where people are saying, you know, I read X hundred books this month. And, you know, that's, you're not reading them. That is, that's not reading. The close look at the text is what's important. And I've also seen videos saying, you know, why you shouldn't reread things. I think that's rubbish. I think you should reread things. If you like a book and a book is genuinely good, it will bear repeated examination and you'll see things in the text which you haven't seen before. And also you change as you grow older with experience and expectation. And, you know, I always come back to Kurt Vonnegut. When I first read Cat's Cradle, which is my first Vonnegut, which is in the early 80s, I absolutely loved it. I was blown away by it. Then I reread it a few years ago and I hated it. But Vonnegut's, you know, one of those people you have to sort of pick and choose and you have to be careful. But Slaughterhouse-Five, I've read four times and usually about five year gaps or more. And I think it's brilliant. I think it's a work of genius. So, you know, you can get more out of it. One of my favourite books from my youth, which had a huge impact in me, on me when I was about 19 or 20, was Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf. And I've tried to reread it twice since then. And I can't do it. And it's not that I disagree with what the book says, that I don't like it. It's just that I have moved on. And in some ways, I've become even more the character that I related to in that book. But I have grown more and more uncertain about how realistic Hess's vision is for Harry Haller. But I'll talk about that when I try and reread it again as the channel goes on. So I think maybe we are reading too much. And I would say to people, you know, slow down, read what you enjoy. And that's why this year you're going to see me reading a lot of authors who I've loved for years. Like I mentioned Thomas M. Dish. So after last year, when I think I read a lot of stuff, which I didn't think was all that great, I'm going back to sort of call people and covering them in depth. And I'm going to keep doing some more overviews for you as well and they're interesting because i often find that a lot of these books i haven't read them for so long that i can't go into vivid detail and often with authors they're late works the things i haven't read and i'm about to do one soon about a writer i really like 
And it's only since I've started the channel that I've acquired his late works, which are mostly fantasy. He was previously an SF writer, and that's Michael G. Coney. And I backed away from them because they felt more like fantasy. And I've realised I haven't read a Coney for ages and ages. So I've got to do some rereading. So you put pressure on yourself. That's the thing. So the healthy relationship with books is a tough one. You've seen me doing lots of collecting and unboxing and you see people falling into book halls. The whole thing with this is that book halls are all very well and good and they're fun. They cost you a lot of money. You end up with too many books. And I can't recall ever feeling the urge to buy it so expansively and extensively before I started the channel. You know, sometimes you'd go along and have some good scores. And I remember the very first time my friend Graham, the grumpy old man and this grumpy old man, went to Hay on Y together. And we'd both been before individually. And we went in a bookshop called Five Star, which was a science fiction bookshop, which if I could go back in the time machine, I'd buy a lot more there. And we went in and we were with Ben Staveley Taylor of Kerosena Books who gave me the Keith Roberts prints. There's a video where I go to meet Ben in the pub and we talk about Keith Roberts. And basically we were going around and we pulled off 50 books. It, this was in the space of about an hour. And I kept going, oh, you must have this, you must have that. And there were books there which had taken me years to find. And Graham was a little bit behind his reading me. And he got 50 paperbacks of 50 quid. And it was just incredible. And I was just like thinking, gosh, it took me so long to build these up. But I was quite glad thinking back because I had time to acquire them and read them as I went along, you know, and that was that was more exciting. Whereas now, you know, you can go along and I do these dealer visits and you can go bonkers and it can be a bit unhealthy. The other side of that, of course, is that is collecting. And people say I have a collection of books. What most people have is a library. They have a load of books. A collector is somebody who focuses on particular things. And I do collecting of SF hardcovers of writers I like between pretty much between 1970 and 1990. And the authors I like who was kept on writing after that, who came up after that. And I buy their books in hardcover first. So that's pretty much what I do. And I do paperbacks. I've started doing nostalgia collecting, which I've talked about a few times where I buy books which I used to sell in my first five years or so of book selling, which was like the golden age, as far as I was concerned, the golden age of book selling. And I'm going to make a video about that at some point, about why the 1980s and early 90s were the golden age of book selling in this country. Uh, but I have to wait for a while before I can do that. For me, there are two things. There's the collecting and the reading. And the collecting kicked in with me, you know, 40 years ago when I started in the industry and I started buying hardcovers modestly and building up. And I see it more of a sort of tortoise and hare thing. And I've generally moved quite slowly through that, gradually acquiring things, thinking carefully, getting rid of things. And it has racked up and I'm moving towards what I call the final library, which will be my pretty much complete collection of high quality hardcover SF, which means a lot to me, both in terms of its iconography and the writing. Um, it'll just be part of my whole library. And I think a lot of people they're not collecting in the way that somebody like me or Jules Burt would say. Like Jules is a complete disc because of numbered things. Kenny RH does that as well. I know I don't. I cherry pick. I'm selective. And I guess I would come down both in collecting and reading on the side of selectivity. Now, because I've read so much SF and a lot of the SF I've been reading the last few years has been to fill in my direct experience of gaps. The things I know about because I've read lots of reference works. I've talked to writers, talked to readers a lot. But sometimes you need that first hand experience and you can tell in videos where somebody doesn't have that. So you do have to do the reading. But a lot of the time I've done that so you don't have to, you know, so it is that thing. And I will make value judgments about what I think is good. And there's a large amount of subjectivity involved, obviously, with all of us that are reading. And that's absolutely fine. But at the same time, you know, you have to find a standard what that standard is and start judging things against that standard. And that's where instinct comes in. And as I've said before, I do have a highly developed instinct about what I will probably like. And that's the thing that makes me put books back on the shelf and not buy them. And that's been a bit compromised, I think, by book two, because, of course, everybody likes a book haul. But we'll see. What else is coming up this year? Hey on why I'll be getting over there again, I think, to sell some stuff on soon before the festival. I don't think I'm going to shoot there again. I've shot at Hay a lot. Um, will I be spending time there next January with my mates? I don't know. 
it's enjoyable but I think I've kind of burned it down I keep saying that and I keep finding things there but something which we weren't planning we were planning to go to Edinburgh in the autumn and that's not going to happen now which is a shame I really wanted to go we're going to go to Amsterdam instead and I'll film something there I'm not sure what yet never been so that's something we're ticking off as I didn't want to travel so much this year because with polymyalgia and a lot of sickness it just really burned me out so I'm hoping that by then I'll be off the drugs I'll be fit and I'll be able to enjoy a proper holiday with a video with us so there we go so ultimately it's quality over quantity I think what we try and do here is give you quality of content the presentation will come thank you to everybody again for the views the likes the comments the super thanks has been fantastic I am hoping to get back to long form shooting soon there's things I've wanted to do for months I haven't been well enough to do they will come I don't think they're going to happen this week so maybe in April and May there is going to be one more dealer visit scheduled for May which Jules and I are doing that will be probably quite a big one that involves quite a lot of time and then I am planning to taper off a bit and not do so much of that sort of thing and focus on improving things the look of the channel and also in coming back on the collection the final library coming together so that's a channel update very very beautiful I think you'll agree thanks for all your views again I'm going to sign off now and you know try and spend some of this week kicking back because I have things planned already I was going to do a lot of shooting um, a couple of weeks ago when the video video was away but as it was I had that terrible cold and I still have a bit of it now but I am getting better so it will come together so I do thank you for your loyalty let me know what your thoughts are on these topics and I'll see you again soon bye for now Thank you.